This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 of Jane Eyre Mr. Rochester did, on a future occasion, explain it. It was one afternoon when he chanced to meet me and Adele in the grounds, and while she played with Pilot and her shuttlecock, he asked me to walk up and down a long beach avenue within sight of her. He then said that she was the daughter of a French opera dancer, Céline Verance, towards whom he had once cherished what he called a grande passion. This passion Céline had professed to return with even superior ardour. He thought himself her idol, ugly as he was. He believed, as he said, that she preferred his taille to the elegance of the Apollo Belvedere. And, monsieur, so much was I flattered by this preference of the Gallic sylph for her British gnome, that I installed her in an hotel, gave her a complete establishment of servants, a carriage, cashmeres, diamonds, dentelles, etc. In short, I began the process of ruining myself in the received style, like any other spoony. I had not, it seems, the originality to chalk out a new road to shame and destruction, but trode the old track with stupid exactness not to deviate an inch from the beaten centre. I had, as I deserved to have, the fate of all other spoonies. Happening to call one evening, when Celine did not expect me, I found her out. But it was a warm night, and I was tired with strolling to Paris, so I sat down in her boudoir, happy to breathe the air consecrated so lately by her presence. No, I exaggerate. I never thought there was any consecrating virtue about her. It was rather a sort of pastille perfume she had left, a scent of musk and amber, than an odour of sanctity. I was just beginning to stifle with the fumes of conservatory flowers and sprinkled essences, when I bethought myself to open the window and step out onto the balcony. It was moonlight and gaslight besides, and very still and serene. The balcony was furnished with a chair or two. I sat down and took out a cigar. I will take one now, if you will excuse me. Here ensued a pause, filled up by the producing and lighting of a cigar. Having placed it to his lips and breathed a trail of Havana incense on the freezing and sunless air, he went on. I liked bonbons too, in those days, Miss Eyre, and I was croquant. Overlook the barbarism, croquant. Chocolate comforts and smoking alternately, watching meantime the equipages that rode along the fashionable streets towards the neighbouring opera house, when, in an elegant close carriage drawn by a beautiful pair of English horses, and distinctly seen in the brilliant city light, I recognised the voiture I had given Celine. She was returning. Of course, my heart thumped with impatience against the iron rails I leant upon. The carriage stopped, as I had expected, at the hotel door. My flame, that is a very word for an opera inamorata, alighted, though muffled in a cloak, an unnecessary encumbrance, by the by, on so warm a June evening, I knew her instantly by her little foot, seen peeping from the skirt of her dress as she skipped from the carriage step. Bending over the balcony, I was about to murmur, Mon ange, in a tone, of course, which would be audible to the ear of love alone, when a figure jumped from the carriage after her, cloaked also. But that was a spurred heel which had rung on the pavement, and that was a hatted head which now passed under the arch port cochere of the hotel. You never felt jealousy, did you, Miss Eyre? Of course not. I need not ask you, because you never felt love. You have both sentiments yet to experience. Your soul sleeps. The shock is yet to be given which shall waken it. You think all existence lapses in as quiet a flow as that in which your youth has hitherto slid away. Floating on with closed eyes and muffled ears, you neither see the rocks bristling not far off in the bed of the flood, nor hear the breakers boil at their base. But I tell you, and you may mark my words, you will come some day to a craggy pass in the channel, where the whole of life's stream will be broken up into whirl and tumult, foam and noise. 
either you'll be dashed to atoms on crag points or lifted up and borne on by some master wave into a calmer current as i am now i like this day i like that sky of steel i like the sternness and stillness of the world under this frost i like thornfield its antiquity its retirement its old crow trees and thorn trees its grey facade and lines of dark windows reflecting that metal welkin and yet how long have i abhorred the very thought of it shunned it like a great plague-house how i do still abhor <sighs> he ground his teeth and was silent he arrested his step and struck his boot against the hard ground some hated thought seemed to have him in its grip and to hold him so tightly that he could not advance we were ascending the avenue when he thus paused the hall was before us lifting his eye to its battlements he cast over them a glare such as i never saw before or since pain shame ire impatience disgust detestation seemed momentarily to hold a quivering conflict in the large pupil dilating under his ebon eyebrow wild was the wrestle which should be paramount but another feeling rose and triumphed something hard and cynical self-willed and resolute it settled his passion and petrified his countenance he went on during that moment i was silent miss eyre i was arranging a point with my destiny she stood there by that beech trunk a hag like one of those who appeared to macbeth on the heath of forests you like thornfield she said lifting her finger and then she wrote in the air a memento which ran in lurid hieroglyphics all along the house front between the upper and lower row of windows like it if you can like it if you dare i will like it said i i dare like it and he subjoined moodily i will keep my word i will break obstacles to happiness to goodness yes goodness i wish to be a better man than i have been than i am as job's leviathan broke the spear the dart and the habergeon hindrances which others count as iron and brass i will esteem but straw and rotten wood adele here ran before him with her shuttlecock away he cried harshly keep at a distance child or go into sophie continuing then to pursue his walk in silence i ventured to recall him to the point whence he had abruptly diverged did you leave the balcony sir i asked when mademoiselle verance entered i almost expected a rebuff for this hardly well-timed question but on the contrary waking out of his scowling abstraction he turned his eyes towards me and the shade seemed to clear off his brow oh i had forgotten celine well to resume when i saw my charmer thus come in accompanied by a cavalier i seemed to hear a hiss and the green snake of jealousy rising on undulating coils from the moonlit balcony glided within my waistcoat and ate its way in two minutes to my heart's core strange he exclaimed suddenly starting again from the point strange that i should choose you for the confidant of all this young lady passing strange that you should listen to me quietly as if it were the most usual thing in the world for a man like me to tell stories of his opera mistresses to a quaint inexperienced girl like you but the last singularity explains the first as i intimated once before you with your gravity considerateness and caution were made to be the recipient of secrets besides i know what sort of a mind i placed in communication with my own i know it is one not liable to take infection it is a peculiar mind it is a unique one happily i do not mean to harm it but if i did it would not take harm from me the more you and i converse the better for while i cannot blight you you may refresh me after this digression he proceeded i remained in the balcony it will come to her boudoir no doubt thought i let me prepare an ambush 
So, putting my hand in through the open window, I drew the curtain over it, leaving only an opening through which I could take observations. Then I closed the casement, all but a chink just wide enough to furnish an outlet to lovers' whispered vows. Then I stole back to my chair, and as I resumed it, the pair came in. My eye was quickly at the aperture. Celine's chambermaid entered, lit a lamp, left it on the table, and withdrew. The couple were thus revealed to me clearly. Both removed their cloaks, and there was the Barons, shining in satin and jewels, my gifts, of course, and there was her companion in an officer's uniform, and I knew him for a young roué of a vicon, a brainless and vicious youth whom I had sometimes met in society, and had never thought of hating because I despised him so absolutely. On recognising him, the fang of the snake jealousy was instantly broken, because at the same moment my love for Celine sank under an extinguisher. A woman who could betray me for such a rival was not worth contending for. She deserved only scorn, less, however, than I, who had been her dupe. They began to talk. Their conversation eased me completely. Frivolous, mercenary, heartless, and senseless. It was rather calculated to weary than enrage a listener. A card of mine lay on the table. This, being perceived, brought my name under discussion. Neither of them possessed energy or wit to belabour me soundly, but they insulted me as coarsely as they could in their little way especially Celine, who even waxed rather brilliant on my personal defects. Deformities, she termed them. Now it had been her custom to launch out in fervent admiration of what she called my beauté mal, wherein she differed diametrically from you, who told me point-blank at the second interview that you did not think me handsome. The contrast struck me at the time, and— Adele here came running up again. Monsieur— "'John has just been to say that your agent has called and wishes to see you.' "'Ah! In that case, I must abridge. "'Opening the window, I walked in upon them, "'liberated Celine from my protection, "'gave her notice to vacate her hotel, "'offered her a purse for immediate exigencies, "'disregarded screams, hysterics, prayers, "'protestations, convulsions, "'made an appointment with the Vicomte "'for a meeting at the Bois de Boulogne. Next morning I had the pleasure of encountering him, left a bullet in one of his poor, escalated arms, feeble as the wing of a chicken in the pip, and then thought I had done with the whole crew. But unluckily the Varons, six months before, had given me this fillet, Adèle, who, she affirmed, was my daughter, and perhaps she may be, though I see no proofs of such grim paternity written in her countenance. Pilate is more like me than she. Some years after I had broken with the mother, she abandoned her child, and ran away to Italy with a musician or singer. I acknowledge no natural claim on Adele's part to be supported by me, nor do I now acknowledge any, for I am not her father. But hearing that she was quite destitute, I e'en took the poor thing out of the slime and mud of Paris, and transplanted it here, to grow up clean in the wholesome soil of an English country garden." Mrs. Fairfax found you to trade at. But now you know that it is the illegitimate offspring of a French opera girl. You will perhaps think differently of your post and protégé. You will be coming to me some day with notice that you have found another place, that you beg me to look out for a new governess, etc. Eh? No. Adele is not answerable for either her mother's faults or yours. I have a regard for her, and now that I know she is, in a sense, parentless, forsaken by her mother, and disowned by you, sir, I shall cling closer to her than before. How could I possibly prefer the spoilt pet of a wealthy family, who would hate her governess as a nuisance, to a lonely little orphan who leans towards her as a friend? Oh, that is the light in which you view it? Well, I must go in now, and you too. It darkens. But I stayed out a few minutes longer with Adele and Pilot, ran a race with her, and played a game of battledore and shuttlecock. 
When we went in, and I had removed her bonnet and coat, I took her on my knee, kept her there an hour, allowing her to prattle as she liked, not rebuking even some little freedoms and trivialities into which she was apt to stray when much noticed, and which portrayed in her a superficiality of character, inherited probably from her mother, hardly congenial to an English mind. Still, she had her merits, and I was disposed to appreciate all that was good in her to the utmost. I sought in her countenance and features a likeness to Mr. Rochester, but found none. No trait, no turn of expression announced relationship. It was a pity. If she could but have been proved to resemble him, he would have thought more of her. It was not till after I had withdrawn to my own chamber for the night that I steadily reviewed the tale Mr. Rochester had told me. As he had said, there was probably nothing at all extraordinary in the substance of the narrative itself. A wealthy Englishman's passion for a French dancer and her treachery to him were everyday matters enough, no doubt, in society. But there was something decidedly strange in the paroxysm of emotion which had suddenly seized him when he was in the act of expressing the present contentment of his mood, and his newly revived pleasure in the old hall and its environs. I meditated wonderingly on this incident, but gradually quitting it, as I found it for the present inexplicable, I turned to the consideration of my master's manner to myself. The confidence he had thought fit to repose in me seemed a tribute to my discretion. I regarded and accepted it as such. His deportment had now for some weeks been more uniform towards me than at the first. I never seemed in his way. He did not take fits of chilling hauteur. When he met me unexpectedly, the encounter seemed welcome. He had always a word and sometimes a smile for me. When summoned by formal invitation to his presence, I was honoured by a cordiality of reception that made me feel I really possessed the power to amuse him, and that these evening conferences were sought as much for his pleasure as for my benefit. I, indeed, talked comparatively little, but I heard him talk with relish. It was his nature to be communicative. He liked to open to a mind unacquainted with the world glimpses of its scenes and ways. I do not mean its corrupt scenes and wicked ways, but such as derived their interest from the great scale on which they were acted, the strange novelty by which they were characterized. And I had a keen delight in receiving the new ideas he offered, in imagining the new pictures he portrayed, and following him in thought through the new regions he disclosed, never startled or troubled by one noxious illusion. The ease of his manner freed me from painful restraint. The friendly frankness, as correct as cordial, with which he treated me, drew me to him. I felt at times as if he were my relation rather than my master. Yet he was imperious sometimes still, but I did not mind that. I saw it was his way. So happy, so gratified did I become with this new interest added to life, that I ceased to pine after kindred. My thin crescent destiny seemed to enlarge. The blanks of existence were filled up. My bodily health improved. I gathered flesh and strength. And was Mr. Rochester now ugly in my eyes? No, reader. Gratitude, and many associations, all pleasurable and genial, made his face the object I best liked to see. His presence in a room was more cheering than the brightest fire. Yet I had not forgotten his faults. Indeed, I could not, for he brought them frequently before me. He was proud, sardonic, harsh to inferiority of every description. In my secret soul, I knew that his great kindness to me was balanced by unjust severity to many others. He was moody, too, unaccountably so. I more than once, when sent for to read to him, found him sitting in his library alone, with his head bent on his folded arms, and, when he looked up, a morose, almost a malignant scowl blackened his features. But I believed that his moodiness, his harshness, and his former faults of morality, I say former, for now he seemed corrected of them, had their source in some cruel cross of fate. I believed he was naturally a man of better tendencies, higher principles, and purer taste than such as circumstances had developed, education instilled, or destiny encouraged. I thought there were excellent materials in him, though for the present they hung together somewhat spoiled and tangled. 
I cannot deny that I grieved for his grief, whatever that was, and would have given much to assuage it. Though I had now extinguished my candle and was laid down in bed, I could not sleep, for thinking of his look when he paused in the avenue, and told how his destiny had risen up before him and dared him to be happy at Thornfield. Why not? I asked myself. What alienates him from the house? Will he leave it again soon? Mrs. Fairfax said he seldom stayed here longer than a fortnight at a time, and he has now been resident eight weeks. If he does go, the change will be doleful. Suppose he should be absent spring, summer, and autumn. How joyless sunshine and fine days will seem. I hardly know whether I had slept or not after this musing. At any rate, I started wide awake on hearing a vague murmur, peculiar and lugubrious, which sounded, I thought, just above me. I wished I had kept my candle burning. The night was drearily dark. My spirits were depressed. I rose and sat up in bed, listening. The sound was hushed. I tried again to sleep, but my heart beat anxiously. My inward tranquillity was broken. The clock, far down in the hall, struck two. Just then, it seemed my chamber door was touched, as if fingers had swept the panels in groping away along the dark gallery outside. I said, "'Who is there?' Nothing answered. I was chilled with fear. All at once I remembered that it might be Pilot, who, when the kitchen door chanced to be left open, not unfrequently found his way up to the threshold of Mr. Rochester's chamber. I had seen him lying there myself in the mornings. The idea calmed me somewhat. I lay down. Silence composes the nerves, and as an unbroken hush now reigned again through the whole house, I began to feel the return of slumber. But it was not fated that I should sleep that night. A dream had scarcely approached my ear when it fled affrighted, scared by a marrow freezing incident enough. This was a demonic laugh, low, suppressed, and deep, uttered, as it seemed, at the very keyhole of my chamber door. The head of my bed was near the door, and I thought at first the goblin laugher stood at my bedside, or rather crouched by my pillow. But I rose, looked round, and could see nothing, while, as I still gazed, the unnatural sound was reiterated, and I knew it came from behind the panels. My first impulse was to rise and fasten the bolt, my next, again to cry out, "'Who is there?' Something gurgled and moaned. Ere long, steps retreated up the gallery towards the third-story staircase. A door had lately been made to shut in that staircase. I heard it open and close, and all was still. Was that Grace Poole? And is she possessed with the devil? thought I. Impossible now to remain longer by myself. I must go to Mrs. Fairfax. I hurried on my frock and a shawl. I withdrew the bolt and opened the door with a trembling hand. There was a candle burning just outside, and on the matting in the gallery. I was surprised at this circumstance. But still more was I amazed to perceive the air quite dim, as if filled with smoke, and while looking to the right hand and left, to find whence these blue wreaths issued, I became further aware of a strong smell of burning. Something creaked. It was a door ajar, and that door was Mr. Rochester's, and the smoke rushed in a cloud from thence. I thought no more of Mrs. Fairfax, I thought no more of Grace Poole, or the laugh. In an instant I was within the chamber. Tongues of flame darted round the bed. The curtains were on fire. In the midst of blaze and vapour, Mr. Rochester lay stretched, motionless, in deep sleep. "'Wake! Wake!' I cried. I shook him, but he only murmured and turned. The smoke had stupefied him. Not a moment could be lost. The very sheets were kindling. I rushed to his basin and ewer. Fortunately, one was wide and the other deep, and both were filled with water." I heaved them up, deluged the bed and its occupant, flew back to my own room, brought my own water jug, baptized the couch afresh, and by God's aid succeeded in extinguishing the flames which were devouring it. The hiss of the quenched element, the breakage of a pitcher which I flung from my hand when I had emptied it, and above all the splash of the shower bath I had liberally bestowed, roused Mr. Rochester at last. Though it was now dark, I knew he was awake, 
because I heard him fulminating strange anathemas at finding himself lying in a pool of water. <coughs> Is there a flood? He cried. No, sir, I answered. But there has been a fire. Get up. Do. You are quenched now. I will fetch you a candle. In the name of all the elves in Christendom, is that Jade Eyre? He demanded. What have you done with me, witch, sorceress? Who is in the room besides you? Have you plotted to drown me? I will fetch you a candle, sir, and in heaven's name get up. Somebody has plotted something. You cannot too soon find out who and what it is. There, I am up now. But at your peril you fetch a candle yet. Wait two minutes till I get into some dry garments, if any dry they be. Yes, here is my dressing gown. Now, run. I did run. I brought the candle which still remained in the gallery. He took it from my hand, held it up and surveyed the bed, all blackened and scorched, the sheets drenched, the carpet round swimming in water. What is it? And who did it? He asked. I briefly related to him what had transpired. The strange laugh I had heard in the gallery, the step ascending to the third story, the smoke, the smell of fire which had conducted me to his room, in what state I had found matters there, and how I had deluged him with all the water I could lay hands on. He listened very gravely. His face, as I went on, expressed more concern than astonishment. He did not immediately speak when I had concluded. "'Shall I call Mrs. Fairfax?' I asked. Mrs. Fairfax? No. What the deuce would you call her for? What can she do? Let her sleep unmolested. Then I will fetch Leah, and wake John and his wife. Not at all. Just be still. You have a shawl on. If you are not warm enough, you may take my cloak yonder, wrap it about you, and sit down in the armchair. There, I will put it on. Now place your feet on the stool, to keep them out of the wet. I'm going to leave you a few minutes. I shall take the candle. Remain where you are till I return. Be as still as a mouse. I must pay a visit to the second story. Don't move, remember, or call any one. He went. I watched the light withdraw. He passed up the gallery very softly, unclosed the staircase door with as little noise as possible, shut it after him, and the last ray vanished. I was left in total darkness. I listened for some noise, but heard nothing. A very long time elapsed. I grew weary. It was cold, in spite of the cloak, and then I did not see the use of staying, as I was not to rouse the house. I was on the point of risking Mr. Rochester's displeasure by disobeying his orders, when the light once more gleamed dimly on the gallery wall, and I heard his unshod feet tread the matting. I hope it is he, thought I and not something worse. He re-entered, pale and very gloomy. I have found it all out, said he, setting his candle down on the washstand. It is as I thought. How, sir? He made no reply, but stood with his arms folded, looking on the ground. At the end of a few minutes he inquired in rather a peculiar tone. I forget whether you said you saw anything when you opened your chamber door. No, sir. Only the candlestick on the ground. But you heard an odd laugh? You have heard that laugh before, I should think, or something like it? Yes, sir. There is a woman who sews here called Grace Poole. She laughs in that way. She is a singular person. Just so. Grace Poole. You have guessed it. She is, as you say, singular. Very. Well, I shall reflect on the subject. Meantime, I am glad that you are the only person, besides myself, acquainted with the precise details of tonight's incident. You are no talking fool. Say nothing about it. I will account for this state of affairs. Pointing to the bed. And now, return to your own room. I shall do very well on the sofa in the library for the rest of the night. It is near four. In two hours the servants will be up. Good night, then, sir, said I, departing. He seemed surprised, very inconsistently so, as he had just told me to go. What? he exclaimed. Are you quitting me already, and in that way? You said I might go, sir. But not without taking leave, not without a word or two of acknowledgment and goodwill, not, in short, in that brief, dry fashion. 
why you have saved my life snatched me from a horrible and excruciating death and you walked past me as if we were mutual strangers at least shake hands he held out his hand i gave him mine he took it first in one then in both his own you have saved my life i have a pleasure in owning you so immense a debt i cannot say more nothing else that has being would have been tolerable to me in the character of creditor for such an obligation but you it is different i feel your benefits no burden jane he paused gazed at me words almost visible trembled on his lips but his voice was checked good night again sir there is no debt benefit burden obligation in the case i knew he continued you would do me good in some way at some time i saw it in your eyes when i first beheld you that expression and smile did not again he stopped did not he proceeded hastily strike the light to my very inmost heart so for nothing people talk of natural sympathies i have heard of good genii there are grains of truth in the wildest fable my cherished preserver good night strange energy was in his voice strange fire in his look i am glad i happened to be awake i said and then i was going what you will go i am cold sir cold yes and standing in a pool go then jane go but he still retained my hand and i could not free it i bethought myself of an expedient i think i hear mrs fairfax move sir said i well leave me he relaxed his fingers and i was gone i regained my couch but never thought of sleep till morning dawned i was tossed on a buoyant but unquiet sea where billows of trouble rolled under surges of joy i thought sometimes i saw beyond its wild waters a shore sweet as the hills of beulah and now and then a freshening gale wakened by hope bore my spirit triumphantly towards the bourne but i could not reach it even in fancy a counteracting breeze blew off land and continually drove me back sense would resist delirium judgment would warn passion too feverish to rest i rose as soon as day dawned chapter 16 of jane eyre I both wished and feared to see Mr. Rochester on the day which followed this sleepless night. I wanted to hear his voice again, yet feared to meet his eye. During the early part of the morning, I momentarily expected his coming. He was not in the frequent habit of entering the schoolroom, but he did step in for a few minutes sometimes, and I had the impression that he was sure to visit it that day. But the morning passed just as usual. nothing happened to interrupt the quiet course of adele's studies only soon after breakfast i heard some bustle in the neighborhood of mr rochester's chamber mrs fairfax's voice and leah's and the cook's that is john's wife and even john's own gruff tones there were exclamations of what a mercy master was not burnt in his bed it is always dangerous to keep a candle lit at night how providential that he had presence of mind to think of the water jug I wonder you waked nobody. It is to be hoped he will not take cold with sleeping on the library sofa, etc. To much confabulation succeeded a sound of scrubbing and setting to rights, and when I passed the room in going downstairs to dinner, I saw through the open door that all was again restored to complete order. Only the bed was stripped of its hangings. Leah stood up in the window seat, rubbing the panes of glass dimmed with smoke. I was about to address her for I wished to know what account had been given of the affair but on advancing I saw a second person in the chamber a woman sitting on a chair by the bedside and sewing rings to new curtains that woman was no other than Grace Poole there she sat staid and taciturn looking as usual in her brown stuff gown her check apron white handkerchief and cap she was intent on her work in which her whole thoughts seemed absorbed on her hard forehead 
and in her commonplace features, was nothing either of the paleness or desperation one would have expected to see marking the countenance of a woman who had attempted murder, and whose intended victim had followed her last night to her lair, and, as I believed, charged her with the crime she wished to perpetrate. I was amazed, confounded. She looked up while I still gazed at her. No start, nor increase or failure of colour betrayed emotion, consciousness of guilt, or fear of detection. She said, Good morning, miss, in her usual phlegmatic and brief manner, and taking up another ring and more tape, went on with her sewing. I will put her to some test, thought I. Such absolute impenetrability is past comprehension. Good morning, Grace, I said. Has anything happened here? I thought I heard the servants all talking together a while ago. Only Master had been reading in his bed last night. He fell asleep with his candle lit, and the curtains got on fire. But fortunately he awoke before the bedclothes or the woodwork caught, and contrived to quench the flames with the water in the ewer. A strange affair, I said in a low voice, then looking at her fixedly. Did Mr. Rochester wake nobody? Did no one hear him move? She again raised her eyes to me, and this time there was something of consciousness in their expression. She seemed to examine me warily. Then she answered, The servants sleep so far off, you know, miss, they would not be likely to hear. Mrs. Fairfax's room and yours are the nearest to master's. But Mrs. Fairfax said she heard nothing. When people get elderly, they often sleep heavy. She paused, and then added, with a sort of assumed indifference, but still in a marked and significant tone, But you are young, miss, and, I should say, a light sleeper. Perhaps you may have heard a noise? I did, said I, dropping my voice, so that Leah, who was still polishing the panes, could not hear me. And at first I thought it was Pilot. But Pilot cannot laugh, and I am certain I heard a laugh, and a strange one. She took a new needle full of thread, waxed it carefully, threaded her needle with a steady hand, and then observed with perfect composure. It is hardly likely Master would laugh, I should think, Miss, when he was in such danger. You must have been dreaming. I was not dreaming, I said with some warmth, for her brazen coolness provoked me. Again she looked at me, and with the same scrutinizing and conscious eye. Have you told Master that you heard a laugh? She inquired. I have not had the opportunity of speaking to him this morning. You do not think of opening your door and looking out into the gallery? She appeared to be cross-questioning me, attempting to draw from me information unawares. The idea struck me that if she discovered I knew or suspected her guilt, she would be playing of some of her malignant pranks on me. I thought it advisable to be on my guard. On the contrary, said I, I bolted my door. Then you are not in the habit of bolting your door every night before you get into bed? Fiend! She wants to know my habits, that she may lay her plans accordingly. Indignation again prevailed over prudence. I replied sharply, Hitherto I have often omitted to fasten the bolt. I did not think it necessary. I was not aware any danger or annoyance was to be dreaded at Thornfield Hall. But in future, and I laid marked stress on the words, I shall take good care to make all secure before I venture to lie down. It would be wise to do so, was her answer. This neighbourhood is as quiet as any I know, and I never heard of the hall being attempted by robbers since it was a house, though there are hundreds of pounds worth of plate in the plate closet, as is well known. And you see, for such a large house there are very few servants, because Master has never lived here much. And when he does come, being a bachelor, he needs little waiting on. But I always think it best to err on the safe side. A door is soon fastened, and it is as well to have a drawn bolt between one and any mischief that may be about. A deal of people, miss, are for trusting all to Providence. But I say Providence will not dispense with the means, though he often blesses them when they are used discreetly. And here she closed her harangue, a long one for her, and uttered with the demureness of a Quakeress. I still stood absolutely dumbfounded at what appeared to me her miraculous self-possession and most inscrutable hypocrisy when the cook entered. Mrs. Poole, said she, addressing Grace, the servant's dinner will soon be ready. Will you come down? No, just put my pint of porter and bit of pudding on a tray, and I'll carry it upstairs. You'll have some meat? Just a morsel, and a taste of cheese, that's all. And the sago? Never mind it at present. I shall be coming down before tea-time. I'll make it myself. The cook here turned to me, saying that Mrs. Fairfax is waiting for me. So I departed. 
I hardly heard Mrs. Fairfax's account of the curtain conflagration during dinner, so much was I occupied in puzzling my brains over the enigmatical character of Grace Poole, and still more in pondering the problem of her position at Thornfield, and questioning why she had not been given into custody that morning, or at the very least dismissed from her master's service. He had almost as much as declared his conviction of her criminality last night. What mysterious cause withheld him from accusing her? Why had he enjoined me, too, to secrecy? It was strange. A bold, vindictive, and haughty gentleman seemed somehow in the power of one of the meanest of his dependents. So much in her power that even when she lifted her hand against his life, he dared not openly charge her with the attempt, much less punish her for it. Had Grace been young and handsome, I should have been tempted to think that tenderer feelings than prudence or fear influenced Mr. Rochester in her behalf, but hard favoured and matronly as she was, the idea could not be admitted. Yet, I reflected, she has been young once. Her youth would be contemporary with her master's. Mrs. Fairfax told me once she had lived here many years. I don't think she can ever have been pretty, but for aught I know she may possess originality and strength of character to compensate for the want of personal advantages. Mr. Rochester is an amateur of the decided and eccentric. Grace is eccentric, at least. What if a former caprice, a freak very possible to a nature so sudden and headstrong as his, has delivered him into her power, and she now exercises over his actions a secret influence, the result of his own indiscretion, which he cannot shake off and dare not disregard. But having reached this point of conjecture, Mrs. Poole's square, flat figure, and uncomely, dry, even coarse face recurred so distinctly to my mind's eye that I thought, no, impossible, my supposition cannot be correct. Yet, suggested the secret voice which talks to us in our own hearts, you are not beautiful either, and perhaps Mr. Rochester approves you. At any rate, you have often felt as if he did, and last night, remember his words, remember his look, remember his voice. I well remembered all. Language, glance, and tone seemed at the moment vividly renewed. I was now in the schoolroom. Adele was drawing. I bent over her and directed her pencil. She looked up with a sort of start. Qu'avez-vous, mademoiselle? said she. Vos doigts tremblent comme la feuille, et vos joues sont rouges, mais rouges comme des cerises. I am hot, Adele was stooping. She went on sketching. I went on thinking. I hastened to drive from my mind the hateful notion I had been conceiving respecting Grace Poole. It disgusted me. I compared myself with her, and found we were different. Bessie Levin had said I was quite a lady, and she spoke truth. I was a lady. And now I looked much better than I did when Bessie saw me. I had more colour and more flesh, more life, more vivacity, because I had brighter hopes and keener enjoyments. "'Evening approaches,' said I, as I looked towards the window. "'I have never heard Mr. Rochester's voice or step in the house today, "'but surely I shall see him before night. "'I feared the meeting in the morning. "'Now I desire it, because expectation has been so long baffled "'that it is grown impatient. "'When dusk actually closed, "'and when Adele left me to go and play in the nursery with Sophie, "'I did most keenly desire it. "'I listened for the bell to ring below.' I listened for Leah coming up with a message. I fancied sometimes I heard Mr. Rochester's own tread, and I turned to the door, expecting it to open and admit him. The door remained shut. Darkness only came in through the window. Still, it was not late. He often sent for me at seven and eight o'clock, and it was yet but six. Surely I should not be wholly disappointed tonight when I had so many things to say to him. I wanted again to introduce the subject of Grace Poole, and to hear what he would answer. I wanted to ask him plainly if he really believed it was she who had made last night's hideous attempt, and if so, why he kept her wickedness a secret. It little mattered whether my curiosity irritated him. I knew the pleasure of vexing and soothing him by turns. It was one I chiefly delighted in, and a sure instinct always prevented me from going too far. Beyond the verge of provocation I never ventured. On the extreme brink, I liked well to try my skill. Retaining every minute form of respect, every propriety of my station, 
I could still meet him in argument without fear or an easy restraint. This suited both him and me. A tread creaked on the stairs at last. Leia made her appearance, but it was only to intimate that tea was ready in Mrs. Fairfax's room. Thither I repaired, glad at least to go downstairs, for that brought me, I imagined, nearer to Mr. Rochester's presence. "'You must want your tea,' said the good lady, as I joined her. "'You ate so little at dinner. I am afraid,' she continued. "'You are not well to-day. You look flushed and feverish.' "'Oh, quite well. I never felt better.' "'Then you must prove it by evincing a good appetite. "'Will you fill the teapot while I knit off this needle?' "'Having completed her task, she rose to draw down the blind, "'which she had hitherto kept up, by way, I suppose, of making the most of daylight, "'though dusk was now fast deepening into total obscurity. "'It is fair to-night,' said she, as she looked through the panes, "'though not starlight. "'Mr. Rochester has, on the whole, had a favourable day for his journey.' "'Journey! Is Mr. Rochester gone anywhere? I did not know he was out.' "'Oh, he had set off the moment he had breakfasted. He has gone to the Lees. Mr. Eshton's place, ten miles on the other side of Millcott. I believe there is quite a party assembled there, Lord Ingram, Sir George Lynn, Colonel Dent, and others.' "'Do you expect him back to-night?' "'No, nor to-morrow either. I should think he is very likely to stay a week or more.' When these fine, fashionable people get together, they are so surrounded by elegance and gaiety, so well provided with all that can please and entertain, they are in no hurry to separate. Gentlemen especially are often in request at such occasions, and Mr. Rochester is so talented and so lively in society that I believe he is a general favorite. The ladies are very fond of him, though you would not think his appearance calculated to recommend him particularly in their eyes. But I suppose his acquirements and abilities, perhaps his wealth and good blood, make amends for any little fault of look. Are there ladies at the Lees? There are Mrs. Eshton and her three daughters, very elegant young ladies indeed, and there are the Honourable Blanche and Mary Ingram, most beautiful women, I suppose. Indeed, I have seen Blanche six or seven years since, when she was a girl of eighteen. She came here to a Christmas ball and party Mr. Rochester gave. You should have seen the dining-room that day. How richly it was decorated! How brilliantly lit up! I should think there were fifty ladies and gentlemen present, all of the first county families. And Miss Ingram was considered the belle of the evening. You saw her, you say, Mrs. Fairfax? What was she like? Yes, I saw her. The dining-room doors were thrown open, and as it was Christmas time, the servants were allowed to assemble in the hall and hear some of the ladies sing and play. Mr. Rochester would have me come in, and I sat down in the quiet corner and watched them. I never saw a more splendid scene. The ladies were magnificently dressed. Most of them, at least most of the younger ones, looked handsome. But Miss Ingram was certainly the queen. And what was she like? Tall fine bust, sloping shoulders, long graceful neck, olive complexion dark and clear, noble features, eyes rather like Mr. Rochester's, large and black and as brilliant as her jewels. And then she had such a fine head of hair, raven black and so becomingly arranged, a crown of thick plaits behind, and in front the longest and glossiest curls I ever saw. She was dressed in pure white, an amber-coloured scarf was passed over her shoulder and across her breast, tied at one side, and descending in long fringed ends below her knee. She wore an amber-coloured flower, too, in her hair. It contrasted well with the jetty mass of her curls. She was greatly admired, of course. Yes, indeed, and not only for her beauty, but for her accomplishments. She was one of the ladies who sang. A gentleman accompanied her on the piano. She and Mr. Rochester sang a duet. Mr. Rochester? I was not aware he could sing. Oh, he has a fine bass voice, and an excellent taste for music. And Miss Ingram, what sort of a voice had she? A very rich and powerful one. She sang delightfully. It was a treat to listen to her, and she played afterwards. I am no judge of music, but Mr. Rochester is, and I heard him say her execution was remarkably good. And this beautiful and accomplished lady— she is not yet married? 
It appeared not. I fancy neither she nor her sister have very large fortunes. Old Lord Ingram's estates were chiefly entailed, and the eldest son came in for everything almost. But I wonder no wealthy nobleman or gentleman has taken a fancy to her. Mr. Rochester, for instance. He is rich, is he not? Oh, yes. But you see, there is a considerable difference in age. Mr. Rochester is nearly forty. She is but twenty-five. What of that? More unequal matches are made every day. True. Yet I could scarcely fancy Mr. Rochester would entertain an idea of the sort. But you eat nothing. You have scarcely tasted since you began tea. No, I am too thirsty to eat. Will you let me have another cup? I was about again to revert to the probability of a union between Mr. Rochester and the beautiful Blanche, but Adele came in, and the conversation was turned into another channel. When once more alone, I reviewed the information I had got, looked into my heart, examined its thoughts and feelings, and endeavoured to bring back with a strict hand, such as had been straying through imagination's boundless and trackless waste, into the safe fold of common sense. Arraigned at my own bar, memory having given her evidence of the hopes, wishes, sentiments I had been cherishing since last night, of the general state of mind in which I had indulged for nearly a fortnight past, reason having come forward and told, in her own quiet way, a plain, unvarnished tale, showing how I had rejected the real, and rabidly devoured the ideal. I pronounced judgment to this effect, that a greater fool than Jane Eyre had never breathed the breath of life, that a more fantastic idiot had never surfeited herself on sweet lies, and swallowed poison as if it were nectar. You, I said, a favourite with Mr. Rochester, you gifted with the power of pleasing him, you of importance to him in any way. Go, your folly sickens me. And you have derived pleasure from occasional tokens of preference, equivocal tokens shown by a gentleman of family, and a man of the world, to a dependent and a novice. How dared you? Poor stupid dupe. Could not even self-interest make you wiser? You repeated to yourself this morning the brief scene of last night. Cover your face and be ashamed. He said something in praise of your eyes, did he? Blind puppy, opened their bleared lids, and look on your own accursed senselessness. It does good to no woman to be flattered by her superior, who cannot possibly intend to marry her, and it is madness in all women to let a secret love kindle within them, which, if unreturned and unknown, must devour the life that feeds it, and if discovered and responded to, must lead Ignis Fatus-like into miry wilds once there is no extrication. Listen then, Jane Eyre, to your sentence. Tomorrow, place the glass before you, and draw in chalk your own picture, faithfully, without softening one defect. Omit no harsh line, smooth away no displeasing irregularity. Write under it, portrait of a governess, disconnected, poor, and plain. Afterwards, take a piece of smooth ivory, you have one prepared in your drawing box. Take your palette, mix your freshest, finest, clearest tints, choose your most delicate camel hair pencils, delineate carefully the loveliest face you can imagine. Paint it in your softest shades and sweetest lines, according to the description given by Mrs. Fairfax of Blanche Ingram. Remember the raven ringlets, the oriental eye. What? You revert to Mr. Rochester as a model? Order. No snivel. No sentiment. No regret. I will endure only sense and resolution. Recall the august yet harmonious lineaments, the Grecian neck and bust. Let the round and dazzling arm be visible, and the delicate hand. Omit neither diamond ring nor gold bracelet. Portray faithfully the attire, aerial lace and glistening satin, graceful scarf and golden rose. Call it Blanche, an accomplished lady of rank. Whenever, in future, you should chance to fancy Mr. Rochester thinks well of you, take out these two pictures and compare them. Say, Mr. Rochester might probably win that noble lady's love if he chose to strive for it. Is it likely he would waste a serious thought on this indigent and insignificant plebeian? I'll do it, I resolved, and having framed this determination, I grew calm and fell asleep. I kept my word. An hour or two sufficed to sketch my own portrait in Crans, and in less than a fortnight I had completed an ivory miniature of an imaginary Blanche Ingram. It looked a lovely face enough, and when compared with the real head in chalk, the contrast was as great as self-control could desire. 
I derived benefit from the task. It had kept my head and hands employed, and had given force and fixedness to the new impressions I wished to stamp indelibly on my heart. Ere long, I had reason to congratulate myself on the course of wholesome discipline to which I had thus forced my feelings to submit. Thanks to it, I was able to meet subsequent occurrences with a decent calm, which, had they found me unprepared, I should probably have been unequal to maintain, even externally. Click the subscribe button and notification bell to not miss the next installments and analysis.